Welcome to Zcast, everyone. I'm Zias Caraval from ZK Research, and I'm uh, joined again by Bob O'Donnell from Technolysis. Bob, uh, you're, you become quite the regular here. Yeah, I'm trying to, Zias. Thanks, man. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, well, so we're both uh, uh, back from uh, Las Vegas, uh, AWS reInvent, where uh, we certainly got our steps in. <laughs> That's for sure, walking around <laughs> that area. <laughs> We got our steps in. We got a thousand press releases in. I mean, it was all, you know. Yeah, just overall thought from the show. I mean, if there was any thought that people were afraid to travel or whatever, that certainly was dispelled. I think there was 65,000 people there this year. Oh, it's uh, back. Yeah, for yeah. sure. No, I mean, it, it's, you know, we're definitely back. Um, and AWS is definitely back to their, their old, not that they're back, they were ever away, but, you know, they had so many announcements. They do, that's, I mean, Having been now to several reinvents, it you know they kind of man they've got that fire hose going in terms of the news. It's hard to make sense of it all, but I I think we'll be able to pull it together and 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 talk yeah, it's hard to, di- to digest that many announcements though. Um, yeah, because I had people ask me about this one and that one. And I'm like I I you know that, I missed that one. So <laughs> uh, exactly yeah. no yeah. I, and you know and by the way, an interesting little side note, but out of curiosity. The the day of the event when sort of those initial news stories typically hit, you know, in the mainstream press and a couple other places, I read about eight or nine of them from everything from CNBC and the New York Times to the Register and the Verge um, and other places in between. And it was almost like there were different events because the each one focused on one little piece and nobody seemed to be able to pull together the whole story, which just you know, exemplifies, I think, the challenge that there is when you when you blast out that much news for people to kind of make sense of it all. So I do think that'll be an interesting challenge for it, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So, yes. Yeah. Well, let's try and do that here. Let's try and time together. Yeah. Um, did, so one of the things I did like, which was interesting because people asked me why Amazon did this, was they led Adam's keynote with a bunch of infrastructure stuff, right? Yes. Um, right. Which in a way... I think supports the overall theme of the show called reinvent right. that you would think something like storage, there's no reinvention left. Right. Right. But indeed for a lot of their core building blocks, which is basically, you know, it's a big chunk of their revenue. They actually did bring some new features and capabilities to it, right? Lower cost, higher speeds, things like that. So they, they are, I, I've always thought this in, in, in corporate IT, there are very few markets that are actually commodities. If you can drive enough innovation to it, people will continue to pay to upgrade. And so, you know, your thoughts on that, it's just the overall reinvent theme. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. And and what we're seeing companies do because of Gen AI is having to reinvent almost everything. And I think they played up that theme, you know, quite a bit, because of course, Gen AI was sort of the, the theme that you just couldn't get away from throughout the event. And the one thing they did try and do is tie a lot of their announcements to Gen AI in some way, shape, or so- form. And, you know, exactly. They start out with infrastructure because I my biggest takeaway, to be honest with you, was this three-layer Gen AI stack, they called it. And I, I would yeah. call it a strategy. And it was infrastructure. It was sort of platform and tools. And then it was applications. And you're right. So they started with the infrastructure piece. They, they had this storage side of things. And then they had new you know ec2 compute instances a number of them being driven by wow new silicon as well so aws continues on that path of doing their own custom silicon they started this a few years back with graviton well technically with nitro and then graviton which is their arm based cpu so they had the fourth generation of graviton uh they had they unveiled the second generation of their tranium ai accelerator for uh, training AI workloads. And then they talked about, although it had already been released earlier this year, uh, Inferentia 2, which is their second generation of their inferencing AI chips. So you're right. I mean, they they had these stories around core infrastructure stuff that, let's be honest, that's kind of what they were originally known for. And then they started to build on top of that, leveraging all this interest in, in Gen AI. Yeah. Okay. So let's save the Silicon discussion and talk Gen AI then. The lead the story or press release, I suppose, if you want to call it a press release, was Q, right? Amazon Q, Absolutely. which was their generative AI interface into all of their products. I thought they did a good job of, you know, describing the way it could be used for, uh, you know, within applications as an intelligence tool, as an infrastructure tool, et cetera. But what did you think of it? 
No, I, I agree with you. And Q was obviously the big takeaway. I mean, it was the big story. The, 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 the funny thing is, you know, everybody saw the conversational, you know, chatbot version of Q, and that's only one of several. Uh, and they jumped on that like, oh, here's the AWS chatbot. It's like, well, that's true, but it's only a, a portion of the story because what Amazon was trying to do is position Q as this overall digital assistant mm -hmm. um, that can do a lot of different things. And and like you said, they did, you know, they said, hey, here's Q for the business person. Here's Q for the analytics person. Here's Q for the programmer uh, in Code Whisperer. Here's Q for the AWS developer in terms of instances to consider and, and products and services to use. So they had Q in a lot of different places, but it's underlying basic ideas. Hey, this is that notion of a digital assistant we've been talking about forever, but being deployed in a way that actually has meaningful impact to people. And, and that's what I think is really getting people's attention around Gen AI is because now we're seeing these technologies that actually do stuff for you to make your life better and easier. Just it can, you know, it can reflect itself or not reflect itself, but kind of implement itself in a number of different ways and and permutations. Yeah, and, and what's interesting about Q um, is to think about the implications it might have to the way Amazon goes to market and even the show in the future. Uh, and for those that don't know, Q actually isn't new per se. Q was the name of the um, the AI engine that they used with QuickSight, right? And uh, what about the QuickSight team? They actually talk about Q growing up now and being used in more places. But there was a good example where historically, to use QuickSight, you would have needed a highly trained analytic person to pull the yeah. data out of you and then put it in a format that the business leader could, could understand. Now the business leader can actually just use Q, go into uh, QuickSight and pull out the information themselves. In fact, in a lot of ways, get more granular information than they could through uh, through that person. And so now all of a sudden, if we can use Q to write code through natural language and we can use you know, uh, uh, Q to do those other things, then all of a sudden, you know, Amazon, which has largely appealed to the builder, now yes. starts to appeal to other people. And that has some really interesting implications on how this company grows up and even what this show should look like two, three, four, five years from now. I would completely agree. And yeah. that is the really interesting twist because like you said, you know, Amazon, AWS has been about builders and people who have the intelligence and, and not just intelligence, but the actual skill sets, very refined and very specific skill sets to do some of these things. And the whole amazing thing about generative AI is it's democratizing things that in the past, you know, no, the average person couldn't deal with. Uh, so like you said, with, with QuickSight, with analytics, you know, why would I ever bother to do any kind of other analytics any, again, when I can just say what I want or type in yeah. what I want and I don't have to build queries. It just finds it, you know, obviously you have to set up the data sources to be proper and there'll be specialists who do that kind of stuff. But once that's set up, I can get whatever information I want. I can build these, you know, dashboards in any way, shape or form that I want and anybody can do it. So it really kind of, I mean, I feel like this notion of big data analytics that we were talking about 15 years ago, you know, promised that you're going to be able to do this. Now it finally delivers. And that's, like you said, that brings Q up to a whole new level. It's that application level, not the builder level and changes the whole nature of what uh, I think AWS starts to do. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I really do think that's fascinating to see how the company evolves from here, um, because it, it is going to be quite a change. I'm not fully convinced they know how to sell to that audience, um, but they certainly yeah. have the, the tools to do it. Probably, I'm guessing partners will play a big part in that. And uh, the partner in AWS has always been kind of a, um, I'm not going to say square peg round hole, but or maybe oval peg round hole. Uh, the addition of Ruba Bernal yeah. has certainly helped that. Uh, but I do think this is where, they do need to think a lot more about being, uh, you know, fueling the partner to drive the stuff versus the marketplace. And well, it's really a combination of the two, I guess. So I, I think it probably will be. And I think you're going to have a lot of people trying to figure out how to make sense of this. You know, the other thing that's very apparent is, and again, Amazon's been, been pretty good about this is thinking about how, they love to offer choice. I mean, they, one of the huge themes, I think, throughout the show as well uh, was 
and, and they've kind of always done this, but they really hammered it home was like, hey, we're not going to pick the way for you to go. We're going to give you like every tool in the, you know, in the toolbox and you pick and choose what you want. But the, what they're starting to do, I think, with Q is also starting to say, you know, that's great, but not everybody knows how to use those tools. So what if we give them a couple of finished projects here or finished applications? Um, and like you said, that typically takes other kinds of skill sets and other types of partners uh, to bring it into place. And so I think that's going to be interesting. The other interesting thing, you start to think about this when you do it competitively versus all the other, you know, co-pilots and other digital assistants is how do these things potentially coexist in the future, yeah, right? That, that is going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah, I think that's going to be a big problem, right? How how do I do that? Because realistically, right, I'm not, I'm not going to use, I, I'm still going to create documents in office or in workspace. And so I'm going to use either Google or Microsoft's assistant for that. But maybe there's some higher level things I'm going to do within Amazon, custom applications within the, within the enterprise that leverage some of that data. So figuring out <clears throat> the coexistence thing is going to be a big question mark moving forward. Yeah, but that takes two to tango. So even if Amazon or Microsoft wanted to, the other party, party would have to be willing to do that. So uh, now on the topic of choice, um, you know, they spent a lot of time specifically within Bedrock. Yeah. Right, talking about the difference that of their approach. And while Adam Slipsky didn't specifically call out Microsoft, uh, well, he did once actually with, uh, I think he did, with, yeah. Yeah, with one of the graphics uh, and open AI. There is a stark difference there. And I, and I did talk to a handful of customers there. And I want to caveat this that we were at an Amazon event, okay, but that did look at the Bedrock and open AI. In fact, one of them had gone down the open AI path and diverted back to Bedrock because of the choice of models. But from the from what I hear from everybody, and I would you know, I don't think this is a real stretch, there isn't going to be one model to rule them all. Right. And customers do need to have choice because L, different LLMs are different strengths in different areas. And so to me, the flexibility of Bedrock is really their strength versus their competitor, you know, the biggest competitor than Microsoft. No, completely agreed. Yeah. And I think you're going to see a lot more companies. Uh, offer that degree of flexibility. Now, I will say you can take that too far, right? Too much choice is just as bad, arguably, as not enough choice because people get overwhelmed with the choices. So, but exactly to your point, different foundation models, um, which and what Bedrock lets you do is choose amongst different models, um, have different capabilities. So obviously Amazon has their Titan models and they introduce more Titan models uh, and hinted at yet even more to come. So they've got their own. Now they're mm -hmm. working more with Meta uh, for the Llama 2 stuff. Uh, they're obviously working a lot with Anthropic, which they just invested in. Anthropic is sort of their version of an open AI, a big partner, you know, who they're aligning themselves with, um, I think, with the Claude 2.1 models um, and other companies. But, you know, what they also did with Bedrock, which is super cool, not only did they um, you know, let you choose amongst models, then they let you choose amongst capabilities, things that you could do, their guardrails to control um, and limit certain, you know, bad material from, from coming in, either offensive material, what have you. Um, and then they also had things like bedrock actions where you could sort of take um, these basic capabilities and build some of your own skills. Um, and, you know, in fact, it was interesting when I, I had some further conversations with some of the folks there. Turns out that Q was actually built with Bedrock. It was kind of their own, using some of these Bedrock actions. That's kind of how right. they built Q. So then all of a sudden it's like, oh, now some of these things are starting to click into place. And I'm starting to understand why they announced them all and why they have this three-tier structure and et cetera. Yeah. And now one of the things that always comes up and I read this in the media, I'm looking at one, you know, Amazon race to catch up to Microsoft and things. Do you, is it, is it a fair statement to say they're behind an AI? Do you think they're just behind an AI marketing? Um, I think, I think they're behind an AI marketing for sure. Yeah. Right. And I, I think um, the way they, the way they did it. And I, I wrote a column about this myself this week, because <clears throat> in trying to make sense of it, because I, I have to admit it, it took me like a day or two for all of a sudden to finally click. I was like, oh, okay. And now I look back historically at some of the announcements they made, like when they initially launched Bedrock, it wasn't super clear what it did and how it really fit in and how it compared to what other folks were doing. But now that they have this sort of 
more complete architecture and strategy, you're like, oh, now I get it. So to back to your original question, I think they were behind in terms of marketing and explaining it. I think they're in a very good good position now. Um, and it'll be a question of, of how effectively they can get consumers or not consumers, businesses to uh, to, de- to deploy it. Yeah. I, so um, I, and I agree with you. I, I think they are behind their marketing, uh, but that's not really ever been their thing. No, right? no, yeah, it's so, not. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, and it's funny, actually, speaking of the consumer thing, there's a part of me, and I, I never said this to anybody, but, you know, they did announce a product a while back that was Alexa for business. And if you think about it, yeah. Q is kind of like Alexa for business, but at a much, much more profound level. But yeah. it is this notion of kind of something that I can interact with in a human way and it does things for me. But anyway. Actually, that's true. You remember even some of the network vendors were trying to get their products to work with Alexa for business and stuff. So yes. I just didn't understand the applicability of that. It's like Alexa can figure my network. Okay. Then yeah. <laughs> and yet, and yet with Q, you can say, hey configure my network yeah. and set up my EC2 instances. So in a weird way, it's kind of come full circle, but yeah, I, I don't imagine yeah. I'll ever use yeah. it. Now that. you did bring up their silicon. Um, yes. And uh, so you're much more of a silicon guy than I am. Um, to explain why it matters for Amazon to build its own silicon. Well, because what they want to do, again, this is an example of choice, right? They, they offer choice in models. They offer choices in tools. They offer choose choices in the bazillion different first database types that they have. And in the case of Silicon, they're doing the same thing. You know, most of the instances they have are with Intel, but and they have a lot, of course, now with NVIDIA GPUs, but they also have AMD. They even have Mac instances, for God's sake. I mean, they have every kind of compute possible. And part of the reason they went with initially with Graviton to do their own custom silicon is because of the power requirements. As they were building larger and larger data centers, they were like, we need to figure out a way to be more power efficient. This isn't sustainable if we, you know, because a lot of these chips, you know, the more powerful x86s and GPUs in particular, they take a lot of power. So their initial efforts were on power efficiency. And that's why they did Graviton. And that's why they started to do both Tranium and Inferentia for similar reasons because they wanted to have chips that they thought could be more power efficient and yet do some of the same kinds of jobs. Plus, frankly, it gave them a a differentiated solution, right? Because I can get Intel and and NVIDIA uh, compute instances at Am, or excuse me, at at Azure or at Google Cloud, but I can't get the ones with their own silicon. And that's why you see Microsoft, of course, just announced custom silicon for um, for Azure. And oh, by the way, Google has had TPUs uh, for as long as, any, in fact, they were probably one of the first with custom silicon. So all of these cloud guys see the ability to have their own chips as a way to do a differentiated offering uh, from the competition. And then hopefully along with it, they're getting better power efficiencies and what have you. You know, it's, it's interesting watching the, the evolution of this too, because for a while uh, the industry went a little crazy that everything you could do, everything in software, everything in the cloud, and you almost forgot about the underlying silicon, right? But I think what some of we're, us did. But yeah, I know what yeah, you're saying. I think what we're starting to learn now is there are some things that are best done in silicon, some things done well in hardware, some things best done in software, and your optimal um, interest, your op- optimal deployment is when you when you maximize those three together. And I think Nvidia has done a good job of that with on-prem infrastructure, and uh, it's good to see AWS doing that now uh, themselves. So yeah. And, and speaking yeah. of NVIDIA, uh, that was quite a few announcements between AWS and NVIDIA at this event as well. I mean, yeah. you know, they, they're they going to be the first to deploy this Grace Hopper 200 GPU, which is they sort of call this, NVIDIA calls a super chip. It has an ARM CPU. Yeah, it's not really a chip. It's a networked chip. It's a, yeah, it's, yeah. It, well, it's a whole module. It's a, it's yeah. a system on a card, basically. But they've got an ARM CPU of their own, of NVIDIA's own design, and of course, their latest GPU. And AWS is going to be the first to use it. And they have the DGX, which is uh, this super computer type system that NVIDIA has offered on its own. Now you're going to be able to get an instance of it through AWS. And in fact, they had a a special thing called Project Cybo, which is apparently the biggest plant tree in the Amazon. That's Yeah, I saw that. (laughs) Took me a while to figure that one out. But anyway, okay, Amazon, I get it. Anyway, it's going to link... 32 of these DGX supercomputer systems together. And 
uh, and I missed this in the initial announcement. I had to read the press release. That's actually being done. AWS is actually building that for NVIDIA's own purposes, for their own internal work. So, oh, I didn't realize. You, oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. It is an internal initiative. Yeah, it's an internal initiative, which is interesting. That you know, NVIDIA would you know decide that hey, we're going to work with Amazon because they know how to build these large systems together. Um, but the point being, it's it just shows how much work. Is going on. Of course, it also shows the fact that Jensen Huang is like king of the of the tech world. He shows up at everybody's event now. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't think there is a uh, a stage that man does not like. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, I appreciated that. That was an excellent tweet. I remember that. Yeah. Uh, so, but but it was good to see him there. So. Yeah. It was. Um, now, uh, one of the announcements that I thought flew under the radar a little bit was uh, Project Kuiper, and you yeah. and I sat in the telco session, and I do think this is you know this is the problem that's been facing the world since we had the internet is that a big chunk of the world is still unconnected, which means they can't order Amazon prime right? or they can't watch prime and they can't get overnight delivery on things. And so, you know, that needs to change, uh, you know, as well as the educational benefits and things like that, but it's really, you know, the ability to get next day delivery that they're missing out on. Uh, but, uh, so Kuiper, yeah, by the way, we should explain that Kuiper is their low Earth orbit satellites. Um, yes, people may not know. Right, which I was actually, gonna say, which brings connectivity to places that yes. historically you couldn't get connectivity, which isn't just you know African nations or things like that. It's it's actually rural America. Yes, it's a, in fact a friend of mine lives in uh, in Gaithersburg, Maryland, at the end of Maryland, right? Like the, all the big internet connections <laughs> are, are, da are down in Virginia. And, uh, but his housing development is kind of far away from all the main, uh, the main area. So they'll never run fiber out there and his cable's kind of crappy. So he's actually using, you know, some kind of huge satellite service, which isn't all that great. So nice. even within our rural or our, our urban areas, we have pockets of, you know uh, connectivity, so it's good to it's good to see um, Amazon and the other vendors trying to do this. I think one of the differences you actually brought up in the Q and A we had about their willingness to work with telcos on this, and talk about why I think that's important and well, why because, I asked this question in the first place. Yeah, I mean, so the issue is because one of the things they announced, particularly at because Kuiper, they've announced a while ago that they're just yeah. kind of getting it going, but what they one of the things they talked about was a private network option. So not only are they going to do the general purpose connectivity, but they were talking about a private network option so that if there were certain companies who wanted to keep some data completely off the public internet, they were going to make Kuiper uh, help enable that. And at my first glance, it sounded like a, a competitive offering versus some of the telcos who are doing 5G private networks. Uh, but in point of fact, as as we you and I were just discussing before this, um, and what they responded to me was, well, no, we're going to work with some of the telcos to help do this. But it just shows you the value of having, you know, when you have some of your own network connectivity, like an entire network that you can start to leverage, uh, that becomes a pretty powerful tool for them. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how they do it both for the general purpose consumer connectivity, as well as for certain specialized enterprise applications where you keep data off the internet, obviously perhaps for government and, and DOD sorts of things, but also for uh, certain businesses, maybe regulated industries that mm -hmm. want to keep uh, some of their data uh, outside of the public internet as they are doing different types of work. Yeah, well, 5G is going that anyways, right? The private 5G momentum seems to be growing. So uh, this, to me, would be uh, real, not exactly the same, but certainly related to that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly so, right. Um, so I was, I was ticking off the boxes here on the things. I think the other interesting theme for them is the growth in apps, right? And they launched, um, the, I didn't see an actual app announcement this year, some updates to connect and things like that. But it's uh, again, most people think of AWS as a builder led uh, organization. They make components, but they actually do make some SaaS apps. They right. launched supply chain last year. They have QuickSight, they have connector contact center app. And what's fascinating about the way they approach the app market is um, they build these things for internal use, right? right? And then customers see them and go, well, we could use that. And they go, okay, here, we'll flip it around and make a customer facing. So by the time they roll it out, it's already, it's not like they even have to monetize it because 
they built it for their internal use. And so all the and money. As we know, that's how AWS started in the first place, right? I yeah. mean, the whole thing <laughs> came from it being an internal network to help them sell their books. Yeah. Um, and so that, that to me, it's going to be, I'm really curious to see where they go next because I've talked to their apps teams and uh, I don't think they're going to go down the collaboration route, even though they have contact center, that's kind of come and gone. They took a shot at documents. Um, I think they realized that really wasn't worth uh, doing it. The good thing is they're not afraid to try stuff and throw it away if it doesn't work. But there's a whole area in supply chain, logistics, HR, things like that, where they could make all those things customer facing. And so I don't know if you follow that part of their business or not, but it's it's pretty interesting to to think of them as a SaaS company because most people don't. Well, no, you're absolutely right. But and and I don't follow it as closely as you do, certainly. But I mean, that's why I was talking about Q being an application in in a yeah. weird way. Q becomes that mechanism through which they start to get recognized um, as doing that. And 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 for their existing app- applications, again, they did a sort of a Q add on, as it were. I mean, for QuickSight, you said it was already there, but they added a Q for Connect. They're adding a Q for Code Whisperer, which is their you know. Their code generation um, and IDE yeah. development, which is an app, really, when you think about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's then an app to build apps. They didn't actually do a business thing, but they talked about Q as a business intelligence kind of tool. And the interesting part was, and because this, they're so good at data, I mean, and that's a huge advantage they have. You know, they built f- connectors to forty different, you know, data sources that are. SaaS-based apps from Salesforce and ServiceNow and all these kinds of things so that you can, in fact, start to query and pull together information across all of those resources. Because if you think about it, that's sort of that magical skill set that Amazon has because they've always been huge, uh, dealt with all kinds of different data sources. Again, all kinds, a billion different database types and, and di- a billion different extensions to those databases. You know, and they were talking about, you know, because with large language models, you have to do vector, you know, vector embeddings and yeah. adding those kinds of vector embedding extensions to existing databases and all this kind of crazy stuff, all of which says to me, if they have the ability to do that, then you can, add some intelligence uh, and all of a sudden they have a very powerful set of, of applications they could build with just those leveraging those data connections. Yeah. All right. Uh, so any other thoughts you want to share from the show? Did you have any, uh, think there was any themes that maybe people missed? Uh, well, I, you know, I, I do think that, I mean, the choice thing was interesting. Like yeah. I, I hadn't figured out, I couldn't at first initially figure out the difference between Bedrock and SageMaker because they were like, well, these are both tools for doing LLM and Gen AI stuff. But it turns out SageMaker is really for building your own foundation models, like kind of from scratch. Bedrock is for saying, hey, you know what? I'm not going to build my own model. I'm going to use some of these existing models and then build from there. So they have all these different choices available. And I think you know that was interesting. And then again, kind of understanding this notion of, Hey, we're, we're, it's a three-pronged strategy and and all these pieces work together and you can either choose the sort of pre-built things or you can choose to build all these things on your own and and that I thought was interesting as well and as companies evolve in their own generative AI strategy they're going to look for choices uh at that level as well so I I think that's also interesting. Yeah, I do think though their portfolio can be a little confusing to know oh, when absolutely. to do what. So, and, uh, and in fact, I think some of the products like, I know, um, uh, there are, and I think they've been trying to do a better job of this. There's certain products that, uh, like Aurora and Redshift last year, they kind of bundled together because one customers never bought one without the other, but yet they sold them as two separate products. And so they're trying to bring more of those things together. So I do think if you think of the core AWS products as, as Legos, right. Uh, some people like the Lego approach, but. Some people also like to buy the Lego kits with the instructions that show you yes. how to make that star, right? So that's exactly uh, right. I, yeah, I think they could. Uh, if there's an area they could improve in, it's it's in that. It's helping people, yeah, stitch those things together. Because unless you're a hardcore, you know, Amazon user, it's it's not always obvious how to do that. So right, absolutely right. right. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Yeah. All right, Bob. We're uh, through the. Uh, we're midway between. Uh, uh, the holidays and uh, you know Thanksgiving and Christmas, and so that is always taken up by uh, reinvent. So <laughs> it was uh, it was good seeing you there. Yeah, uh, you too, man. 
and uh, you know, I think that's kind of going to wrap up the travel season for most of us, huh? Yeah, sounds good. Well, I appreciate yeah. it. Good to chat with you, and uh, I'm sure I'll see you in more events uh, next yeah. year. So it's always good having you on. On behalf of Bob O'Donnell and T.S. Caravallis, and thanks for watching. Uh, hit that subscribe button. Uh, Bob, if you want to send me a link to that article you referred to, I'll make sure it's included in the YouTube description below. And uh, other than that, thanks for joining. Me.